watch it on the Facebooks. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Good meeting you. Take care. Oh, yeah. Need the paper itself. That'd be helpful. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Begin. Uh, welcome to our 10 a.m. panel. Um, the panel is called Personal Writing, Tennis, John Green, and uh, David Foster Wallace. So this promises to be uh, very interesting. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, each presenter uh, just before they, they speak. Uh, our first presenter is Andrew Varnon. Uh, Andrew is he lives in Greenfield, Massachusetts with his family. Uh, he's the winner of the 92nd Street Y slash the Nation Discovery Award in Poetry. Um, and he has previously taught a course called Beer, Baseball, and the Bible at Western New England University. Uh, he now coaches high school tennis at Greenfield High School. Uh, and he's brought along with him several tennis props so <laughs> we'll see what he's, uh, he's about with all that. Um, his talk is entitled, The Other Side of the Net. Uh, please introduce, or please welcome Andrew. Thank you. Um, so the essay, I'm gonna read um, the sort of the first, about third of it, and the last third of it. Um, I have to skip about five, four or five slides in the middle. Um, what I might do is run up and just fast forward over it. Um, but without further ado, um, if, if you're interested in reading the essay in its entirety, I do have a stack of cards here that, that gives uh, the address for where it's been published online. Um, the other side of the net, or a delicate operation performed with a tennis racket into the exhumed literary skull of David Foster Wallace. Hey, I say, and pause for a moment, slinging my tennis bag over my shoulder and closing the car door. I start down the grassy slope toward the tennis court. It is my opponent I have called out to inside the fence. I swing the gate open and let it clang behind me. Now I shuffle a little on the court to hear the clay beneath my shoes. The court waits for us swept of any previous play. We are ready to begin. The way I imagine it, we are at the Highland Courts, a short drive from my home. The Highland Courts are a set of four natural red clay courts at the edge of a forested town park, right next to a somewhat secluded neighborhood of Victorian houses from the town's factory heyday. We are alone, he and I, perhaps in the early morning. He has something of a blank look on his face, dressed not a little uncomfortably in a set of what looks like Wimbledon whites, except not so bright, rumpled even. But he has on his trademark head rag, tying back his hair. Maybe there is small talk as we unpack our bags. The weather, or when was the last time each of us played? Does he want to warm up short? standing on the service line and trading easy half volleys? In the kind of tennis I play, the adult recreational kind, there is a certain unease to begin, a mix of friendly get-to-know-you banter with an overlay of the what sort of opponent will you be subtle interrogation 
Perhaps this is not unlike sizing up a new book, or maybe even more so for a book whose reputation at this point certainly precedes it. I started reading David Foster Wallace's signature novel, Infinite Jest, in December 2015. It's here where the essay pivots, where I note the ghost that haunts this essay, the late David Foster Wallace, has also rematerialized out of the internet ether, the Me Too conversation. Following allegations about novelist Juno Diaz and his treatment of women, the poet and memoirist Mary Carr expanded on earlier allegations about Wallace's treatment of her. Her revelations about Wallace's abusive behavior go beyond what is reported in the DT Max biography, Every Love Story is a Ghost Story. And I have no reason to disbelieve her. In a poem Carr wrote called Suicide's Note, a speaker addresses a former lover, presumably Wallace, who has committed suicide and laughs in revenge at him that though he believed his soul was otherwise only probable, he was, in fact, every second, alive in a hard-gnawing way for all of us who breathe you deeply in. I was a little surprised to receive it as a Christmas present from what I thought was an unlikely source, my in-laws. Whose gift-giving tendencies, I don't mean this uncharitably, might be described as risk-averse. But it turns out that I had mentioned the book in my Christmas elf letter, almost in passing, as I was trying to think of things to put on my list. The point is, it was a modest list. I often asked for t-shirts from craft breweries where my brothers live. And a book was an afterthought. The book has loomed in my consciousness for some time, but I've only come to seriously consider reading it, and in fact, to actually read it, because of tennis. I was aware of Wallace 20 years ago, in the fall of 1996, when I arrived in Amherst, Massachusetts to study at UMass in the university's somewhat famed MFA in Creative Writing program. I say somewhat famed. What I mean is that at the time, the UMass MFA program was ranked 10th in the country. It was something of which I was well aware. I was a poet, not a fiction writer, but I was aware of Infinite Jest as having the reputation of being the sort of Ulysses of our generation, a book that was known by all to be a work of genius, but also difficult and quite long, so reading the book was an undertaking few would actually complete. I remember coming away from the first social event in the lounge of Bartlett Hall. On a campus which architecturally ranged from the old ag school brick buildings to the brutalist concrete of the 1960s building boom, Bartlett Hall, where the English department was located, was a nondescript low-rise building seeming to shrug its shoulders and blend in. Thinking that I was woefully underprepared in terms of the reading I had done up to that point. But as a poet, reading Infinite Jest wouldn't be on my to-do list. Instead, I had to figure out who this John Ashbery guy was and what the heck language poetry was. Four years later, with a better grasp of Ashbery, but still somewhat baffled by language poetry. I finished my MFA and went into journalism. And by journalism here, I mean I got a job as a reporter at the daily newspaper in the small town where I live. I started to get interested in nonfiction. Along the way, I read some of Wallace's magazine pieces, like the one he did on talk radio, Host, in the Atlantic, and the one on Webster's Third, Tense Present, in Harper's, where he explored lexicography and the divide between the prescriptivists and the descriptivists. These magazine articles were brilliant. Here was a guy who was obviously smart. That's what these endnotes are supposed to show, right? But what really intrigued me was the way he followed his diverse and sometimes esoteric interests, dove deeply into them and explored them, and explained them in an engaging way. As I was making the move from a daily newspaper to a weekly and trying to write magazine -y pieces, I really saw what Wallace was doing as a model. I thought of magazine writing as working with layers so that you would weave together first-hand reporting with backstories and larger thematic material. I saw Wallace able to zoom in to describe his subjects with precise detail 
and also to seamlessly pan back out and explain concepts with an eye to the big picture. It wasn't until later, when I had been given the corporate boot for my journalism job, and my wife and I ended up with a house. This happened about the same time. The old weekly I was working for was part of a chain ultimately owned by the troubled Tribune Company. And I was laid off in a round of chain-wide downsizing after we had signed the papers for the house, but before we moved in. That I happened upon the tennis court, actually the five tennis courts that were two blocks from our new house. The student readers here will note that this is a different set of tennis courts that I opened the essay with, which is to say, there are two sets of these clay courts in town. An extravagance seemingly hard to square with the town's hard scrabble tool and die factory legacy. <laughs> courts that I would end up walking by a lot. They were natural red clay courts, and they pulled me back into tennis, a game that, contrary to what my father keeps telling people, I should say that my father has moved to the town where I live so that he and my mother could be full-time grandparents in their retirement. I introduce him to my tennis community, and this line, that he wishes one of his sons had taken up tennis, is how he repays me. I had played when I was a kid, and I played with my buddies in high school, but that I hadn't really kept up with. But it is a game that now, as a middle-aged adult, I would take up with a passion. Meanwhile, I started teaching as an adjunct instructor at a local college. I found myself teaching Wallace's This is Water essay. The essay, which was posthumously published as a book, was originally given as a commencement address at Kenyon College. To my students, as a part of a unit on the value of higher education, I liked using the Wallace essay for the movies of the mind exercise, where I reveal a small snippet of the essay the title first, then the first sentence, then the first paragraph, then the first page, etc., and project it for them on the screen in front of the room, and then have them write in response to just that small snippet, then we talk about it, then we go to the next one. What's great about Wallace in this essay is that you can see him move, you can see him double back, change direction. He's very intentional with what he's doing. And I always end up talking to my students about how you can sense the author here looking at you, the reader, anticipating what you're thinking. That in some way, as we sit here uh, in that room, looking up at the words projected on the screen, we can see the act of reading and of writing as a text suspended like a screen between a reader and an author. On our side, as readers, we try to construct meaning from words we see and guess at the author's intention on the other side. In Wallace, you get a sense of an author who's palpably there on the other side of the screen, also guessing at us. Maybe you can see where I'm going with this. It is often said that the act of reading Infinite Jest is like watching a tennis match. Because of the voluminous endnotes, so a good piece of advice when you start out reading Infinite Jest is to get two bookmarks. One to keep your place in the text itself, and then a second one to keep your place in the hundreds of endnotes, some with material that's quite consequential to the narrative of the novel, at the back of the book. So that in reading the book, you keep having to flip from one bookmark to the other, back and forth, back and forth, like a spectator at a tennis match. But what I found is that the act of reading Infinite Jest is like playing in a tennis match with Wallace on the other side of the net. And I realize it's all the more haunting because of Wallace's suicide in 2008, not too long after giving that famous This is the Water, I'm sorry, This is Water commencement address at Kenyon College. So that reading Infinite Jest is like playing tennis with a ghost. Reading the, inf the, the Kenyan speech has a haunting feeling to it as well, because Wallace writes about the liberal arts education as a stay against the terrors of ordinary life, and about suicide as killing the terrible master of the head. Moreover, the older fish 
younger fish story that Wallace leads with in that essay, what the hell is water, the younger fish asks as the punchline, appeared earlier in Infinite Jest, told in the context of an alcoholic anonymous meeting between recovering addicts. Here's where I'm going to skip forward. Um, I think what I need to do is go up here and see if I can forward through the slides without um, and you can see I'm going to skip ahead to slide 13 and we'll start from there. In his interview on the National Public Radio program, Fresh Air, Wallace was quite keen to disabuse Terry Gross of the idea that he was a junior tennis player of national talent, although she thought it an apt part of his biography to mention. But something else that Wallace said in that interview has always stuck with me. He relates his tennis coach telling him, you've got a bad head, kid. What the coach meant was that the young Wallace was unable to quiet his mind, to stop thinking about what might happen on the tennis court, what winning or losing a point might lead to, all the permutations that take you away from the necessary attention on the present, on <coughs> performance. But it's hard not to read that line and hear the echo of Wallace's own suicide and the subsequent revelations about his struggle with depression. And doubly so, not to think of James O. in Candenza, the departed father of Infinite Jest, who stuck his own head in a microwave after creating a film so toxically pleasurable it saps anyone who views it of their will to do anything else but spectate. Wallace describes in Candenza in the novel as having been a junior tennis player himself. And in a flashback scene, we hear an extended monologue in Candenza's own father delivers to him critiquing the Cartesian notion of the mind-body duality. Wallace tips his hand when he has the elder in Candenza alluded to British philosopher Gilbert Ryle's famous ghost in the machine description of Rene Descartes' mind-body theory of mind. In Candenza appears to be agreeing with Ryle's materialist critique of Descartes. The key line is perhaps this, son, you're a body, son. The father here delivers the hard news to his 10-year-old son as a way of preparing him to be a tennis prodigy. The mind? It's just neural spasms. Those thoughts in your mind are just the sound of your head revving. This is pretty hardcore materialism. A tennis ball is the ultimate body, kid, the elder Kin Candenza tells the son. Perfectly round, even distribution of mass, but empty inside, utterly, a vacuum. Compare with Wallace's speculative conclusion to his rumination on Tracy Austin's ghost-written autobiography, Beyond the Center Court. The real secret behind top athlete's genius, then, may be as esoteric and obvious and dull and profound as silence itself. The real, many-veiled answer to the question of just what goes through a great player's mind as he stands at the center of hostile crowd noise and lines up the three free throw that will decide the game might well be nothing at all. This idealization of emptiness contradicts what we have come to expect about Wallace, the author. Many people profess to appreciate Wallace because, with his maximalistic prose and tendency towards metacommentary, he writes with an uncanny awareness of an active inner life. That's certainly something I appreciate about Wallace's work. As I made my way through Infinite Jest, I thought about all the basic ways that it is difficult. It's long, that's the most obvious, but also it carries on half a dozen more primary plot lines with a large class of characters set in a speculative near future. Additionally, the structure of the novel is not immediately apparent, but takes shape by accretion. Did I mention that it unfolds in nonlinear fashion? And Wallace hides the timeline behind the running joke of co corporate sponsored subsidized time? I can see how reading the novel would seem daunting. But like the complexity by which Wallace describes a tennis match with the geometry, angles, strategy, and movement 
The pleasure in reading Infinite Jest comes when you start to get it. When you begin to see the parallel courses of the different plot lines and ideas, when you start to try to anticipate what's happening and why. Critics have argued this is why the ending of the novel has caused such consternation. It does not appear to resolve the novel's narrative arc, but instead seems to leave it implied for the reader to play out in his or her head. I started this essay before I had finished Infinite Jest, while the game was still on. After finishing, I can't escape this nagging feeling that I lost, that I didn't get it, that it was too much for me as a project. The pages came to an end, but my mind, my engagement with the characters and themes of the novel, kept carrying on. Maybe I need to read it again. Maybe I need to look into the secondary sources, engage with the community. I understand that this is not an uncommon feeling when finishing the book. In fact, I believe that this is the reason why online reading groups and other Wallace communities have sprung up as people finish the book and seek out other people who've read it to ask the question, what happened? Am I understanding it right? Oh, I thought that was going to be longer. Um, part of the fame of Infinite Jest is built on the novel as a monument to Wallace's genius, his brilliance. It is his achievement, and it is impressive. It is a juggernaut of a book. But on the other hand, I think it is the nuance of the book, the small moments, and the tenderness that stick with me. Ultimately, I imagine Wallace not as this granite figure, but as somebody who might occur there on the clay. What I'd like to do now with this essay is to continue to my imagined tennis meetup with Wallace but it is hazy and hard to sustain, like the graveyard scene alluded to in the novel, but never actually described, where Hal Incandenza and Don Gately dig up James in O. Incandenza's head, trying to find a tape of the toxically pleasurable film he made, known as The Entertainment. The graveyard scene is a reference to Hamlet. In fact, the title Infinite Chest is a reference to Hamlet. It is how Hamlet describes Yorick, a clown whose skull he addresses in the famous scene. Yorick, Hamlet says, was a fellow of infinite jest. Interestingly, although this Shakespearean parallel would lead you to believe that Hal is like Hamlet, in many ways he is not at all. Hamlet talks out his indecision throughout the play, while Hal is depicted as being trapped in his own head, unable to communicate his interior life. I don't know how the tennis would go. It seems entirely possible, given the hierarchy of tennis, that my playing with Wallace would be just as obscene as his playing with Michael Joyce, from the part of the essay that I've skipped over. But I'd like to think I'd learn something, and I have questions I'd like to have asked him. These clay courts in my town, in a circuitous way, led me to his book. And I have fallen into tennis the way that many of the characters in the book fall into obsessive behaviors or addictions. Everybody worships, Wallace says in his Kenyan speech. Ask my wife and she would tell you in great detail how I often leave her with our two kids to go off to play tennis matches that ultimately mean nothing. Tennis is not my livelihood. If anything, it's a distraction from my livelihood. But I find myself drawn in, wanting to improve, to get my first serve percentage up, to work on my split step and refine my overhead. In the same way, I could ask, why read a book like Infinite Jest? Why play recreational tennis as an adult? The novel challenge us, challenges us about our American propensity for lazy pleasure, the way we substitute a sort of spectatorship for citizenship, giving ourselves over to our petty addictions. Maybe tennis as an activity is a salve against that, and maybe reading a difficult novel is better mental exercise than watching television or browsing the internet. But then again, maybe it's vain to think so. When success is measured in viewers and followers and sales, the idea of being a reader or an amateur athlete is enigmatic. Wallace is recognized as a brilliant author, but his fans are often regarded as insufferable and smug. In tennis, we often talk about the strategy of a match as one player asking questions and the other player answering. 
The question I have for Wallace is, ultimately, what is the value of an inner life? And more so, what is the value of being able to express it? Does this, what we're doing, matter? This year, I taught the Kenyan speech to my students again after having read Infinite Jest. And this time, I felt the need to describe Wallace as something more than a difficult novelist who had committed suicide. Both of those things are reasons to reject him, to reject what he has to say. He wrote a book I won't ever read, that I probably wouldn't get through, that I wouldn't understand, I can imagine a student saying. And how did all that wisdom help him? He killed himself. I hear those criticisms, but despite them, I still find what Wallace has to say relevant, maybe even more so. What he describes in his speech, like trying to think of what's going on in the mind of a driver of the SUV that cuts you off on the highway, could be described as mere empathy. See how obvious and unimportant that sounds? I get it, I hear people say. But what I hear unsaid is, I've heard that before, I don't want to listen to it again. The problem is that I fear my imagination is not enough to conjure Wallace. Even my effort in the opening of this essay to suggest the wraith of him waiting for me behind the fence seems almost embarrassing. Before I finished the book, I had an ending for this essay planned, one that I was trying to write toward, but it felt harder to get to after I reached the end of the novel. That original planned ending goes like this. I string up the net when I open the book, and I swear to you, someone is there, keeping the rally going, with every looping description drawing you out into the alley, only to wrongfoot you in your recovery, every well-placed illusion which you can only stand and admire, every superscript number which leads you backpedaling to your second bookmark way back there by the fence. Here is this guy that through his writing has awakened in me and many others this seemingly obvious idea that what you need to do is try to be aware of the other guy, the guy, in tennis anyway, on the other side of the net. And he's not there. Wallace isn't. He's left us. His suicide is the obvious logistical obstacle to my fantasy of playing tennis with him. It is, as Hal says at his father's grave yet side, too late. And yet, that terminal event coincides roughly to the time when I began to come back to tennis. The timing of my return to tennis is purely coincidental to Wallace's suicide, but it is interesting for the purposes of this essay, not unlike a converging plotline in Infinite Jest, that this return not only led me to Wallace's magnum opus, but also gives me an opportunity to reconnect with my own father. These are the kind of things I'd like to tell Wallace now, between ground strokes. I had a conversation recently on the playground that is right next to the tennis courts, the clay courts next to my house, near my house. There's a guy who lives in the house right next door, and his name is inscribed on the trophy for the local tennis tournament more times than any other name in the past 20 years ago. He doesn't play much anymore, although he's probably about my age. Kids and life have taken him away from the game. We were standing there while I pushed my daughter on the swing, and he told me that he accomplished everything he wanted to on the tennis court, and there's not much that pulls him back. I think about what he said, and I think about how it's different for me. I'm pulled back. Maybe I'll never get my name on that trophy, but what pulls me back is that bouncing ball. It's up there in the air, and you hit it. And the guy on the other side, I can, I can he hits it back. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Okay. okay, our next uh, speaker is Michael O'Connell. Uh, Michael is Associate Professor of Humanities at Siena Heights University in Adrian, Michigan. Um, he's published essays in a number of scholarly journals focusing primarily on the intersections of religion and contemporary literature. Uh, and he's currently working on a study of violence in contemporary American Catholic fiction. Uh, his talk today is entitled Spirals All the Way Down, Mental Illness in the Work of David Foster Wallace and John Green. 
All right. So, um, hi everybody. Thanks for your talk. That was great. Um, I wish I had footnotes. The clicker. So fun. <laughs> uh, okay. So I'm going to talk today about uh, a very popular writer with deep ties to the Midwest. One with a history of mental illness who went off his medication because he felt it was interfering with his writing process. One whose work focuses on trauma, the importance of empathy, sincerity, how to pay attention, where to direct our focus, how to live a good and meaningful life. A writer who loves sports, who writes about infinity, an occasional prolific user of footnotes, one whose book titles allude to Shakespeare, and who generated a ton of press and some pushback from the somewhat showy publicity campaign around his best-selling novel. A fiction writer who spends a ton of his energy on work that is not fiction the subject of long profiles in The New Yorker and interviews with Terry Gross, one who gave a commencement address at Kenyon College that subsequently proliferated across the internet and whose lines have appeared on tchotchkes, large and small. I'm talking, of course, about John Green. <laughs> so my point with this list isn't just, just to show that Green and Wallace have a surprising number of similarities in both their work and their biographies, though I do find them fascinating. I only discovered them after I started looking more deeply into Green's work, which I did because his novel, the, Far the Fault in Our Stars, blew me away. So Wallace talks about the click that he experiences when he reads a work that makes him feel, quote, human and unalone, and that, I'm in, that I am in a deep, significant conversation with another consciousness. Um, this is an idea that resonates with me, and it's something that I felt uh, both when I read Infinite Jest for the first time, um, but it's also what happened when I read Green's work as well. So, like I did with Wallace, when I finished Green's book, I went out and I read everything that I could find by and about him to get a better handle on who the author is and what they're all about. And the interesting thing that I found about John Green is that while he is among the most popular young adult novelists in the world, I mean, if you go into Barnes & Noble, there's like always an end cap display of, of John Green stuff. Um, he's also just a wildly popular YouTube personality, um, the host of two different podcasts with his brother Hank. He's at the head of a so whole sort of like internet world. Um, they make crash course videos they're used in high school to sort of like teach you, you know, math and science and literature. Um, he sponsors conferences. Uh, they raise millions of dollars for charities like Partners in Health uh, through a sort of internet tel telethon they call the Project for Awesome. Um, and I think this internet presence that John Green has created fascinates me because it also sort of has an interesting parallel to Wallace. Um, I'm sure most of us are familiar with the Wallace L. Listserv. Uh, the Great Concavity Podcast, um, Infinite Summer type group reads. Um, people who love Wallace's work or are confused by it or challenged by it turn to the internet to find answers, like Andrew was just saying. Um, in this way, Wallace is a writer who inspires community. It is in part, I think, why many of us are here. Um, I remember walking in New Orleans about a decade ago and I was wearing my um, and at house t-shirt and a bouncer outside a bar stopped me and was like, oh man, infinite jazz. And then we had like a 10 minute conversation. Um, and I had, a, I had a Pizza John shirt, which is a John Green sort of internet meme. Um, and I was wearing that and the same thing happened. So, you know, the sort of shared fandoms create these interesting real world connections. Um, and I think this connectedness is something that Green actively encourages in all sorts of ways. Um, and I think it's central to both effectiveness and effectiveness of his work. One reason I've been drawn to Green's writing and the online community he has helped create and to foster is because it strikes me as a sort of embodiment of the solution to the isolation and sadness at the heart of modernity that is central to Wallace's work and also to Green's. Wallace said, basically, that we are too alone, too trapped in the prison of our own consciousness, too committed to things that don't matter. And one way past this is to commit ourselves to something bigger than ourselves, to seek out community and connection, and this is something that Green has dedicated himself to building. Just this past week, I was listening to the podcast 99% Invisible, uh, which is a great podcast. And Roman Mars was interviewing Green about Green's podcast, The Anthropocene Reviewed, which I think might be my favorite podcast going right now. And Green said a couple of things that will resonate with any Wallace scholar. Mars was asking him about, him about his work, and John Green said, quote, I like to be able to ask the big questions without creating a lot of distance between myself and the questions. And then also, ironic detachment is the single most overrated characteristic in a human being. Uh, he said this while admitting that for much of his younger years, he believed and acted the exact, exact opposite. And I think it's likely that Wallace's position vis-a-vis -vis irony and sincerity influenced Green, or at least Green was attracted to Wallace because of how he treated these themes. In a number of places, Green's dis 
discussed his love for Wallace. Um, Green was even a contributor to the initial Infinite Summer online project. In Green's novel, The Fault in Our Stars, he has a novel within a novel called An Imperial Affliction, which his main character, Hazel, um, adores and is constantly rereading throughout the book. And Green said that, quote, most of the references that my characters make to an imperial affliction are related in some way to something from Infinite Jest. And that he said this is true in part because Infinite Jest played that kind of role in his own life when he was young. He said in college he basically believed Infinite Jest to be like scripture. And that Wallace's arguments regarding attentiveness, focus, the pleasure, significance, and responsibility of observation were very important to the themes of his own writing. And then in his press tour for his latest best-selling novel, Turtles All the Way Down, he said, quote, Wallace writes about anxiety and psychic pain in a way that resonates with me like no one else ever did. And he went on to say that Wallace, the way that, he, that Wallace wrote about it, quote, made me feel seen and understood and alone in the best way. Okay, so with all this in mind, I'd like to look at how both Green and Wallace address this kind of anxiety and psychic pain in their fiction. Wallace and Green both write powerfully about mental illness, in part because both knows, know how it feels to live with it. In Turtles All the Way Down, Green writes about a teenager suffering from severe anxiety and OCD, afflictions that Green himself has battled. And for the remainder of this talk, I want to talk, discuss how Green's portrayal of mental illness differs from Wallace's most notably in The Depressed Person. This isn't, of course, the only place where Wallace writes about the subject, but I think it is his most focused treatment on it. So if you were there for a large talk yesterday, there's a little bit of overlap um, in just you know, the focus on the story, but it's good to have that all in mind. So The Depressed Person is told in a close third person, where the style of the piece reflects the interior life of the titular depressed person, a woman of indeterminate age, who, as the opening line tells us, quote, was in terrible and unceasing emotional pain, and the impossibility of sharing or articulating this pain was itself a component of the pain and a contributing factor in its essential horror. The story has no real plot development. It just traces out the protagonist's internal state as she attempts to deal with her depression. The story takes us through her discussions with her therapist, and after the therapist appears to kill herself, through her increasingly desperate phone calls to her support system of childhood friends. Mostly, the story attempts to reflect the line between depression and narcissism. It captures this woman's mindset, her depression, and then the inescapable spiral she enters into, where her inability to express accurately how she feels and her lack of connection to others leads her to continually reach out to the people in her life, but this doesn't actually make her feel better, and it leads her to an intense feeling of self-loathing, which then loops around back to her depression and her desire to explain it and to share it. The story also demonstrates the ways in which this woman's emotional pain makes her blind to the pain of others. The story was originally published in Harper's, and then it was revised and expanded for publication in brief interviews. The Harper's version is about 6,500 words. The brief interview one is about 10,500. And I have to admit, when I was working on this talk, I mostly went back to the Harper's one, because I couldn't stomach the extra 4,000 words. Because <laughs> I have to admit, I find the depressed person to be an almost unbearable reading experience. There are other stories, particularly in the brief interviews, where Wallace writes about more horrific subject matter, and I don't really love revisiting those either, but on the pure reading level, the depressed person is uniquely difficult. Wallace himself said that writing it was, quote, the most painful thing I've ever done. That character is a part of me I hardly ever write about. There's a part of me that is just like that person. Well, Wallace's comment here is presumably more about how difficult that level of emotional honesty is, and this is something worth coming back to. Zadie Smith puts her finger on why it's so distressing to actually read the story, writing that here Wallace puts us inside the process of recursion, and this is why reading it is emotionally and intellectually exhausting. The effect on the reader is powerful, unpleasant. To read those spiral sentences is to experience the dread of circularity. One suffers to read it, but suffering is part of the point. And as she often is, Zadie Smith is right, of course. Part of the difficulty with the story is that it's linguistically torturous. It's a story made up of increasingly Baroque run-on sentences, ones with clauses buried inside of clauses, sort of nesting doll of pain, where you can't finish a thought without burrowing down into the layers and layers of thought that un undergird the initial idea. It's both just literally difficult to get through and emotionally exhausting to be in that headspace. You do come to feel a level of pity or empathy for her, 
as you experience what it must be like to think in this manner. Elaine Scarry, in her seminal work, The Body in Pain, writes about how other people's pain is elusive. This is a little bit of a longer quote. For the person in pain, so incontestably and unnegotiably present is it that having pain may come to be thought of as the most vibrant example of what it is to have certainty. While for the other person, it is so elusive that hearing about pain may exist as the primary model of what it is to have doubt. Thus pain comes unshareably into our midst as at once that which cannot be denied and that which cannot be confirmed. That's the end of the quote. So this is one reason that most of the language around pain is metaphorical. What the depressed person does, or at least attempts to do, is position us inside the mental space of the person in this kind of psychic distress, so that we are thinking along with her, and thus experiencing something like what it might be like to have your brain function in this way. Perhaps it moves us from doubt to a form of certainty. But one difficulty that I have with the story is that while I think it's undeniably masterful at capturing this mental space in excruciating, deta in excruciating detail, I think it's also just a cruel story. I don't need to get into whether or not this is really a deliberately unflattering story about Elizabeth Wurzel to argue that Wallace tips the scale against his protagonist in ways that seem needlessly excessive. I think it's one thing to have the depressed person's therapist kill herself and have the depressed person think mostly about how this affects her, the DP, rather than the therapist's loved ones. She recognizes this failure and it's one more spiral that she enters into in the story. But at the end of the story, Wallace writes that the depressed person's principal remaining support person, at this point she's just spiraling and constantly calling the next person on her list of friends. Um, as soon as one conversation's over, she's dialing the next number. Um, but the one person that she thinks of as her, her most important friend, her most readily available friend, um, is one of her childhood friends who, quote, had recently undergone her second course of chemotherapy for a virulent neuroblastoma, which was leaving her almost always at home and available to talk. And it's not enough that Wallace juxtaposes the DP's emotional pain with her terminally ill friend's physical and emotionally draining cancer. He highlights the depressed person's selfishness by having her spiral on the phone with this friend about how little she cared for or knew about her therapist. And in the midst of this spiral, Wallace writes, quote, and here the depressed person waited patiently for an episode of retching in, her, in the especially available trusted friend to pass before the depressed person goes on to say how worried she is about her, quote, capacity for basic human empathy and compassion. So throughout this unending paragraph, Wallace is repeatedly just juxtaposing the depressed person's worry about her own lack of empathy with reminders of the friend's cancer and how the depressed person doesn't acknowledge it. So while over the course of the story we have come to feel empathy for the depressed person, here, by the end of it, I think we come to loathe her, as she surely loathes herself. Many of the people, as Allard noted yesterday, um, who have written about the story focus on the depressed person's narcissism. And I think this final juxtaposition is one reason they do, because it's inescapable. But does this then invalidate what's come before? Should we feel empathy for her? Is she choosing to act this way? In one of his more widely quoted pronouncements, Wallace claimed, quote, everybody worships, the only choice we get is what to worship. But I think one of the horrors of the depressed person is that it demonstrates the limits of choice. The protagonist is not choosing to be dominated by her recursive thought spirals. She is the victim of them. They circumscribe her ability to choose anything, what to think about, value, commit herself to. And I think this question of the relationship between free will and mental illness is crucial to our understanding of the depressed person and it's also the main theme of Green's novel. So in Turtles All the Way Down, he takes the epigraph of the book from Schopenhauer. Man can do what he wills, but he cannot will what he wills. And this idea of how much control we do or do not have over ourselves is the central concern of the book. Green's novel is told in the first person voice of a high schooler named Aza. And while the plot revolves around a mystery, the billionaire father of one of Aza's childhood friends has gone missing and she and another friend team up to try to find him. And there's a romance angle as Aza and the billionaire's son reconnect. Over the course of the novel, both of these plot strands deliberately recede in significance. And it becomes clear that the real focus of the book is on Aza's mental illness, how it shapes her experiences and how she copes with it. As I said before, she suffers from anxiety and OCD and intrusive or invasive thoughts. Like the depressed person, Aza is almost entirely focused on herself. As her best friend points out in a crucial scene, Aza doesn't even know what her friend's parents do for a living. 
And like the depressed person, she is the victim of unbearable thought spirals. Hers mostly evolve around or revolve around the fear of being contaminated or infected. In one of the most harrowing scenes in the book, she's in the hospital because she's been in an accident and she ends up drinking hand sanitizer because she's afraid that she's been infected. Um, even though part of her mind knows that it's not a rational thing to do, she can't really control the invasive thoughts that are driving her actions. The novel begins with the line, the first time I thought, uh, the first time I realized I might be fictional, and then it goes on. But what she means by this isn't some sort of metafictional ploy, but rather the idea that as individuals, we aren't fully in control of our own thoughts. We are, in a sense, the construct of forces we cannot see or understand. It's a sort of riff on determinism, both philosophical and biological. As she describes it, everyone has strange thoughts now and then, but, quote, for some people, the invasive can kind of take over, crowding out all the other thoughts until it's the only one you're able to have the thought that you are either perpetually thinking or distracting yourself from. And for her, one of the things she can't stop thinking and worrying about is microbes inside of her body. How, quote, by cell count, humans are approximately 50% microbial, meaning that about half of the cells that make you up are not yours at all. And she's troubled by this idea that these other bodies have a sway over how we think and act and feel. We think we are in control of our thoughts and desires, but she says, you can't know whether you're the bid doing the bidding of some parasite or the bacteria in your gut. Not really. And this is true of all people, but it's particularly evident in the case of individuals suffering from mental illness, where their brain chemistry controls their mood and or their, and or their thought patterns in extreme ways. And as Aza points out, to get normal means taking drugs, introducing other external forces into the equation. Throughout the book, she's hesitant to take her medication because she feels that in some way, she felt, quote, some way, way down fear that taking a pill to become myself was wrong. Who is deciding what me means? Me or the employees of the factory that makes Lexapro? Which I think circles back around to this is water. If we are all prey to biological forces and some of us to illness, either mental or physical, how helpful or capital T true is Wallace's advice that we can choose what to worship? In his own commencement address at Kenyon College, Green, like Wallace, draws attention to that old line that a liberal arts education teaches people how to think. And he goes on to offer his own similar perspective on the true value that it provides. Whereas Wallace says the real value of a liberal arts education is that it teaches you to be mindful in your choice of what to think about, Green says, I think it mostly teaches you how to listen. And this is where I'll end. I think this is a helpful element for understanding the difference between how Wallace and Green write about mental illness, at least in these two instances. In the depressed person, the protagonist is her illness. In Turtles, Aza has an illness, but the entire thrust of the novel is about defining, both for Aza and the reader, that this does not mean that she is only this illness. Late in the novel, Aza points out how we expect the arc of the story to take the character from illness to wellness that her illness will give her some sort of insight into the missing billionaire, help her to win love, and then recede as, quote, along the way, I realize I have agency over myself, that my thoughts are only thoughts, that I realize my story, that my life is a story I am telling, and I am free and empowered and the captain of my consciousness. But then she interrupts herself and says, that's not how the story arc goes. Instead, she says, the reality is, quote, relentlessly and excruciatingly dull. She gets better without ever quite getting well. And it's clear she'll continue to struggle with her illness, that she'll continue needing to take medication, needing therapy, needing support. But whereas in the depressed person, we leave the story with a sense of judgment on the title character. Here, I think we do truly feel empathy and come to recognize that Aza isn't defined by her illness. In another commencement at Butler University, Green says, quote, you will always be stuck inside of your body with your consciousness, seeing the world through your own eyes. But the gift and challenge of a liberal arts education is to see others as they see themselves, to grapple meaningfully with this cruel, crazy, beautiful world and all its baffling complexity. And I think this baffling complexity is something that I find in both the best of Wallace and Green's work. Thank you. panel and just go to about 10.55, so there's time for a few questions. Awesome. I loved both of these. Um, the, the John Green, I, so I, I never knew this, I never knew all this influence stuff, but I, 
in the in the book, there's the line that he where he just says one of the less bullshitty conventions of the you know the cancer process or something like that. And I, mm, that sounds Wallaceian for you know. sure. Yeah. So, um, but uh, so I, I appreciate this. This was really good. And the 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 thing about turtles all the way down, where you're talking about microbes and the. Uh, I was reminded of Broom of the System and Lenore's uh, obsession with cleanliness and how she showers all the time. Yeah. And uh, and the doctor, I can't remember his name, but he 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 uh, he says uh, hi, 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 you know, our obsession with hygiene has to do with our obsession with identity. And, and so anyway, it's, it's not a question; it's just a, a yeah. So that I when I was, as I was doing a little bit of reading about it, so John Green, he's on a internet hiatus this year, but he used to be like a big Reddit commenter. So people would write about his books, and then he would drop it jump in and say things in response, and in the, mm -hmm. the turtles all the way down Reddit thread, somebody asked him about connections between Lenore, because it's the same idea of fearing that you're oh, really? a construct, um, yeah, and exactly. fictional is also you know, something that goes on in the ruined system, and he's like, yeah, yeah, you know, it wasn't a deliberate, but there's definitely those kind of yeah. connections and parallels. There. That was really interesting. Yeah. So, thank you both. Yes, I wanted to ask, um, is there kind of a difference in audience between the turtles and Lenore? Do you have kind of more to say about the kind of young adult maybe direction of Hungry? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, um, although interestingly, as I was reading about this, Zadie Smith, who I, I think her chapter on brief interviews that's in, um, I don't remember what she, the essay collection my mind. Yeah, yeah, is like one of the best things written about Wallace in general. Yeah. But she says, you know, ultimately, I think Wallace is going to be a writer who is most beloved by the young. That, like, she found that, you know, the Young, young people want to read sincere fiction about big issues, um, which is what Wallace does, and it's what John Green does. Obviously, John Green is much more accessible. Like, any book takes two days to read, not two months. Um, <laughs> and, and his prose is, you know, much more um, mainstream. Um, and he's, I, I think he's much more popular. I think he's sold way more books than, than, than Wallace has. Um, but I think both of them actually have a similar, like, sort of uh, shorthand in the popular consciousness that, that isn't entirely accurate. Like, John Green gets sort of like, oh, he writes about sick kids, and it's somewhat dismissive, maybe. Um, but then when you actually go and read the work, it's much more complex than you might expect, mm -hmm. which I think is true, you know, sort of, of the Wallace lit bro idea that's come up a lot. And then you actually get into it, and you're like, oh, there's so much more interesting and complex than what we might expect it to be from the sort of the, you know, pop culture image of who this person is. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that really answered the question. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess like tying into that, I think it's also this like culture text idea of the adaptations on film. So sure. do you think maybe there's, I guess, uh, the difference between them being that Wallace hasn't really been adapted other than like, the brief interviews one? But uh, do you think that factors in at all, and is that something you've researched? Yeah, it's not something I've looked into at all, but I imagine that there's something to be said for that. I mean, Wallace has, um, you know, the movie about him, and then brief interviews, which I don't think was terribly successful. Actually, I never watched it. But um, whereas John Green, you know, the Faulkner Shot is like wildly popular movie, and then Paper Towns is a somewhat popular movie, and then there's a, a Hulu show of his first novel, Looking for Alaska, that's coming out that I think is probably going to be a big deal. Um, Again, in part because I think it's really accessible stuff, you know, like it's, these are sort of short, emotionally resonant stories, whereas Wallace is, I think, just a lot more difficult to adapt because it's a much more complex you know, point of view and all that kind of stuff. There we go. Just to add super quickly to what Fern was talking about, I believe that in the story that Wallace published when he was at Hammer's The Planet Trilophon as it stands in relation to the bad thing, there's a lot of kind of meditation about cleanliness and looking in the mirror. And I think there might even be something with hand sanitizer, but I don't remember. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, they both, both Wallace and Green sort of biographically have, you know, Wallace was always worried about how much he sweats. Green's talking about a similar thing. Like, I think there's just the idea of the body as sort of a problem to be dealt with is, mm -hmm. is a reality for mm -hmm. both of them. We'll do one more question. Just uh, starting start with Andrew, but kind of, you know, kind of ended you both with, with both this, this kind of, um, the footnotes in the depressed person um, take up, you know, kind of sizable chunks. Obviously the, the footnotes that you're, that you're kind of referring to are going back and forth. I mean, you think there's a way of kind of seeing that as, as one as a sort of temporal, Kind of shift in the with the tennis analogy, you know, this kind of you know maybe a kind of slow motion kind of shot that 
forces that's kind of slowing down, and also the the, the, um, the idea of the, the, the sort of depressed person, you know, this kind of allowing the time to get so deep into this kind of, you know, for anyone who's ever had kind of problems or issues with depression, this kind of endless kind of circling in on oneself is, is anything to... Uh, well, and maybe I'll do this in a way, but one of the things that I enjoyed about what you talked about is that you mentioned the sort of recursive aspect. Um, I started off my college career as a computer science person, and the, the, the recursive algorithm um, is very interesting. You know, a, a, a function that calls itself in, in order to solve the problem. Um, and a recursive algorithm is supposed to work. It's not supposed to get stuck in the middle and keep going. You know, but, that, but, but one of the things that you do to prevent that is to have an out. That, that every recursive algorithm has a place where you kick out of the out of, out of the system, but I think similarly the, the effect of the notes, you know, the, the the footnotes is to break up that rhythm, you know, and it was important to me in doing the presentation here to try to make that real, um, and I liked the sort of the idea of having me read and then have the disembodied voice sort of jump in and do that because it has that sense of breaking the frame of, of the presentation and forcing you to sort of consider what's going on. I think Wallace kind of uses the notes in the same sort of way as that sort of meta commentary, that way of sort of making you think, okay, that I'm thinking about the act of reading. I'm thinking about, oh, I'm here on the page, I have to flip, I have to, you know, I have to look and I have to come back I have to make, in some ways, a choice because you have a footnote that comes in the middle of the sentence and you think, do I finish reading the sentence? Mm -hmm. Or do you go read the note and then come back to it? And he has see, like notes in Infinite Chess that are like 30 pages long. You know, and when you come back, it's like you have to refresh what was going on, you know? And he has notes that refer to other notes, you know? Uh, you know so, I mean, I think that really um, it, it has that sort of recursive sense where it's, he's trying to force you to think about the structure. Yeah, I'll just to add real quick, we're probably out of time, but um, in Infinite Jest, I like how you're talking about, you know, that sort of back and forth, the play. I feel like in the, the depressed person, you know, there's still footnotes, but I think they work differently. Like, I think it's not, cause you, it, it just gets deeper and deeper, and they get longer and longer as the story goes along, like, deliberately. Like, each time it's a longer, more immersive, sort of, like, just upsetting entering into this, like, layer under layer of her, of her thoughts. Um, so it, I think in Infigest it breaks it up and moves you around and it keeps you actively engaged in it, whereas in the depressed person it just sort of is like a slog that pulls you under, which represents again her mental state throughout the story. So just in general, like Wallace, you know, he always, well not always, often uses footnotes, but I think that in different instances they, they serve different functions or they work differently. Mm -hmm. um, did you, had you heard him read, uh, like it sounds a lot, your, your version of doing the audio footnotes sounded like his version in um, when his audio notes, book. Yeah, uh, in a different voice. Yeah, so yeah. Have you, have you heard recorded. him? Like, I just, I really liked it. Wallace so, yeah, that? Wallace's own audio books for um, the nonfiction, the last nonfiction book. Um, Everything in one. Both yeah, flesh. Oh, and in Consider the Lobster. Yeah, Consider the Lobster's audio book. He does audio. it. He does, yeah, they do something weird with his voice. I don't, I don't know. No, I haven't. Oh, it's cool. It, it, it what's interesting like is because the audiobook of Infinite Jest eschews with the notes. Right. Um, and just reads it through. Um, and they had the, the podcast, Great Concavity, had the guy on who re read the book mm -hmm. and talked about the choices they made and how to go about reading it. And I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, yeah. We need to bring this to a close. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, like to walk out of here with one book note or two, you know, I'd be happy to uh, furnish them. Nice. Thanks for moderating. Yeah. If I wrote you, would you mind sending me a Because I would love to have a lot of She would. I don't remember. She's going to be upset. Oh, was that up? <laughs> But I'll do both. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
I had mentioned to her, uh, there were a few things too that I sort of picked up on in all my practice in her life. I gotta think these may be encountered. She she's the most important. Yeah. So if you if you don't mind, I'll absolutely put you out of here. Great. Oh, because she had the I mean, I play for U.S. Yeah, that's beginning was just, yeah. and we that's drive around. So around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you're going, I think you're going. Yeah, yeah. 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 Y